<laughs> oh, that's hot. That's hot. Before I get into this video, I wanted to give another of my famous disclaimers. While most of the information in this video comes from recent research within the field of geometric algebra, many of the ideas have existed for a good amount of time already. Some have been around for over a hundred years. Furthermore, as the ideas in this video are not originally mine, I've linked to some papers in the description. I've also included the bivector.net discord link because the authors of those papers are members, actually one of them runs the discord, and they are often online to help. If you haven't seen geometric algebra or exterior algebra before, and if you want to rigorously grasp the concepts of this video, then I really recommend that you learn it uh, or about it before continuing. I have some series on the subject, although they are a bit old. For a quick crash course, I recommend Suji's channel. The link will also be in the description and hopefully as a card right now. But even if you have no background in geometric algebra, I think you could still learn something by watching this video. Oh, and make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoy it. Also, subscribe. Do it. Do it, I dare you. There will be three sections to this video. Vectors are hyperplanes. What is a reflection? And the invariant decomposition theorem. This video will be presenting ideas in the language of plane-based geometric algebra, which has conceptual differences when compared to vanilla geometric algebra. If you're not familiar with this approach, then I recommend that you watch the first two sections of this video. If you are, then feel free to skip to the last section. Although, if you do already know plane-based geometric algebra, then I'd assume you already know what the invariant decomposition theorem is. But without further ado, let's get into it. You might be asking yourself, what is a hyperplane? Well, look at a plane in three-dimensional space. It's just a flat, two-dimensional surface. So in three dimensions, a plane is a flat three minus one dimensional object. The natural generalization of this is that a hyperplane is a flat object of one dimension less than the space it inhabits. I asked Google's AI to generate an image of a hyperplane, and it gave me this abomination, which just looks like the profile photo of a conspiracy theorist. So as a better visualization, compare these two images. I would give a visualization of a three-dimensional hyperplane in four-dimensional space, but unfortunately it turns out that that is beyond human cognition. Sorry. But looking at these images, notice that the intersection of the two-dimensional plane with the xy plane in the three-dimensional space forms a one-dimensional hyperplane, also called a line, in the two-dimensional space, of course. This idea of intersection is very important to the approach this video teaches. But what do vectors have to do with this? The idea is, in principle, very simple. Instead of representing a point or direction, a vector represents an individual hyperplane. In three dimensions, this looks like three orthogonal planes. The red plane is the unit vector in the x direction, the green plane is for the y direction, and the blue plane is for the z direction. I've included the notation of E1, E2, and E3 because that is how basis vectors are traditionally labeled in geometric algebra. For the rest of this video, I will use that notation. What if we were to consider the intersections formed by these planes? Then we would have three separate lines. For those wondering about the lines coloring, I've colored the lines according to the plane to which they are orthogonal. E12 is orthogonal to the E3 plane, E23 is orthogonal to the E1 plane, and E31 is orthogonal to the E2 plane. This illustrates a geometric and mathematical duality in three-dimensional space. Actually, in any dimensional space, there is a duality akin to the one on screen, so it's not unique to three dimensions. The images here demonstrate the geometric duality, and the math to the right demonstrates the mathematical duality. For those unfamiliar with geometric algebra, the product between E1, E2, and E3 is identical to the imaginary number i, and it is traditional to denote it i. Now, we know what the products between basis vectors represent and that they represent intersections of geometric objects, so what is the project product between E1, E2, and E3 that is used in the mathematical dualities? This product is just the intersection of all three lines and represents the origin of the space, 
Therefore, one benefit of using vectors to represent hyperplanes is that there is an explicit introduction of an origin into the mathematics representing geometric space. This is not something that happens in the traditional interpretation of vectors. So origins are assumed to exist, but are typically only assumed implicitly. Having shown that vectors represent planes in three-dimensional space, I would like to emphasize that this works in arbitrary dimensions. To motivate this, here are equivalent results in two-dimensional space. Defining a reflection formally is somewhat abstract. A reflection is an involutory mapping from some space to itself that is an isometry with an invariant hyperplane. Hopefully, you know what this means. Just kidding, I'll explain it. The first nerd term is involutory mapping, which means a map that is its own inverse, or rather, a mapping that, when applied twice, does nothing at all. The second term that's important is isometry, which means to preserve angles and distance. The third and final term is invariant, which means something that stays the exact same after performing the mapping. Since it is an invariant hyperplane, a reflection is associated with some hyperplane that is the same before and after the reflection. So when non-nerd speak, a reflection is some transformation of an object in space that, when applied once, does not change the shape of the object and has some associated hyperplane that stays in place, and when applied twice, does nothing. This is easiest to demonstrate in two dimensions with a line and some shape. Here we have a line and a triangle. Reflecting once gives a mirror image of the triangle on the other side of the line. Note that this line, which is being used to reflect the triangle, is itself the invariant hyperplane. Reflecting a second time then undoes the original reflection. Now let's do some algebra. Recall from earlier that vectors can be used to represent hyperplanes, and that for each reflection there is a corresponding hyperplane. Therefore, vectors represent reflections. That's all well and good, but what does this mean? How would one actually perform a reflection using a vector that represents a hyperplane? This is where the knowledge of geometric algebra comes in handy. As a very brief introduction, reflections in hyperplanes are given by this sandwich equation. It is traditional to deal with normalized hyperplanes, where u squared equals positive 1. In general, you can also use hyperplanes that square to negative 1, but that's not very important here, so we will only work with positive squaring hyperplanes. This factor depends upon the grade of the object being reflected, and determines whether the object has its orientation inverted during the reflection or not. As we're covering reflections in hyperplanes, we're only considering vectors. Vectors are grade 1, so the reflection in a hyperplane has a negative sign out front. I also reckon that some simple yet concrete examples will help with understanding. So let's look at the basis vectors, or basis hyperplanes, in three-dimensional space. Reflecting E1 in itself returns negative E1, which means that what was on one side of E1 suddenly is on the other side of E1, which makes sense. It's a reflection. Practically speaking, E1 can be thought of as having an extrinsic orientation which inverts itself when E1 is reflected in itself. Generally, any hyperplane reflected in itself will invert itself. But for the hyperplanes orthogonal to E1, these are the hyperplanes E2 and E3, they are unaffected by the reflection in E1. Let's see this visually. When the hyperplane E1 in three dimensions is viewed from the side, it just looks like a line. The extrinsic orientation of the E1 hyperplane is drawn as the orange arrows. Thus, when E1 reflects in itself, the arrows and thus the orientation flip to the other side. This is what the negative sign in the reflection equation means. Now let's see what E2 and E3 do when reflecting E1. While looking at E1 from the side, E2 looks like the line going perpendicular to E1, and E3 just looks like the plane itself. The arrows of E2 denote the orientation of E2, and the crosses in E3 represent its orientation as arrows going into the screen. Reflecting this space in E1, the arrows and crosses respectively of E2 and E3 stay in the same direction. This is why there is no negative sign in these reflections, 
the orientation of a hyperplane is preserved when reflected in a hyperplane that is orthogonal. This is all the information that is required to understand reflections in hyperplanes, so we are now ready to see how all motion comes from such reflections. Before giving this decomposition theorem, there's another jargony word to know. This term is the k-reflection. A k-reflection is simply the product of k individual hyperplanes, and it is written as big U sub k. It is referred to as a reflection because it is the chaining of many reflections under the same sandwich product. Knowing this, the invariant decomposition theorem states, a k-reflection can be decomposed into exactly k over 2 ceiling commuting factors. When k is even, there are k over 2 floor commuting factors that are products of two hyperplanes, and when k is odd, there exists also a leftover hyperplane reflection. Now I know the question you're all dying to ask. What does the theorem say in math form? Well, here it is. If r is the number of such factors, then u sub k can be factored into a sub r, a sub r minus 1, and so on. When k is odd, there is the leftover hyperplane u sub leftover. These factors all commute, as denoted by the ajal equals alaj. Physically, this means that you can perform any combination of reflections and still get the same result. In three-dimensional space, the invariant decomposition theorem is equivalent to a well-known theorem in geometry, the Moseschall theorem. Every three-dimensional rigid body motion can be decomposed into a translation along a line followed by or preceded by a rotation around the same line. This short video from the Laplace wiki demonstrates the Moseschall theorem. But I'm sure some of you still have a question. How are these motions equivalent to reflections in hyperplanes? Let's look at a two-dimensional example. Imagine two hyperplanes, u1 and u2, with some angle theta between them. Suppose there is some object p in this space. It can be reflected in u1, and then this object can be reflected in u2. Well, this composition of two reflections actually just describes a rotation by two theta. As those of you familiar with spinners, this is very related and provides an excellent visualization tool. I'm considering making a video on it in the future, but we'll see. Also, for those familiar with geometric algebra, it's clear that this is the rotation through the expansion of the geometric product of these two hyperplanes. A similar line of reasoning can be shown for a translation. Instead of angles, we have a distance d. Note that the total translation covers twice the distance, just like the rotation before covered twice the angle. From a first glance, it seems that there could be spinorial quantities related to translation. And maybe I'll cover that in a future video. Who knows? But both the example of rotation and translation in two-dimensional space were a preparation for viewing the mosey shot theorem in terms of reflections. So let me show you a visual visualization. Here is a situation I rendered using a geometric algebra render that my current employer developed with my help. For letting me use this in a video for the public, thank you Mr. Boss, very cool. The red planes represent the two planes of reflection that generate a translation in three-dimensional space along the, the x-axis. The green plane represents the E2 plane, and the blue plane represents the E3 plane. Together they generate a rotation about the x-axis. Therefore, reflections in these hyperplanes describe the motion in the Moseschall theorem, demonstrating that indeed any form of motion is just a composition of reflections. Tying this back to the invariant decomposition theorem, the invariant decomposition of this motion is given by the double reflection of u1 and u2, along with e2 and e3. As you can see, they are commuting factors like the theorem stated. Now, the results given in this video were explained using geometric algebra, but specifically something called projective geometric algebra, which allows for geometric entities to exist at points separate from the origin. But don't let this fool you. The hyperplane-based interpretation works for space-time too. Oh, and conformal geometric algebra. And oh yeah, also regular ol' vanilla geometric algebra.
In fact, the association of vectors with hyperplanes works in general geometric algebras. If you don't know what this means or implies, don't worry too much about it. It's a niche but growing field. For, but for those of you who know what I'm talking about, I urge you to explore the possibilities. If you have any ideas, feel free to reach out. You can find my contact information easily, and I'm also available on the Bivector Discord server. As a recap, this video showed that vectors are hyperplanes, that reflections can be performed using hyperplanes and thus using those vectors, and that composing reflections generates motion. I hope this video was informative and helped give insight into the beauty of geometry and the potential of geometric algebra as an abstract mathematical representation of this geometry. If you enjoyed this video, please show that to the YouTube gods by liking and subscribing for similar content in the future. Feel free to comment and ask questions, or to just talk in the comment section. But remember, keep it civil.